So the title tonight is The Deliverer Has Delivered. Thank you, Jesus. So we'll give you a definition of what deliver means. It means to provide or to supply or to, fi- or to furnish something. Amen? It means to, also means to save. Come on. To save, to rescue, to set free, to liberate, to release, and to be loosed from. Amen? Deliver also means to fulfill. Follow the description of the deliverer. He who has already delivered. Come on. Deliver means to fulfill, to live up to, to carry out, to carry through, to implement something, to make good. Tonight we want to talk to you about the one who is known as Jehovah Yireh. The God who provides. Amen? In Genesis 22, 13, we're going to be going on screen in just a little bit with some of the scriptures, but um, in Genesis 22, 13, the Bible says, then Abraham lifted up his eyes. You all know Abraham? Come on. Come on. You know, you know the story. You all know Abraham. God had promised him a son, and his wife, Sarah, was barren, and he was old in his age. And the uh, The consideration, the possibility of them um, having a child was far beyond the natural means of man. But because we serve a God of the supernatural, okay, one person got it. Because we serve the God of the supernatural, God is able to do anything. The Bible says all things are made possible through God. Amen? Amen. And so in the impossibilities of man, God intervenes on the life of Abraham. Sarah conceives a son, Isaac, and now uh, Abraham is put to a task. He's put to a test. Now, how many know God will sometimes put us to a test knowing that the outcome will always result in victory? I said the outcome will always result in victory. It may not feel like it when you're going through it, but the outcome, and we've got a great description for you there, the outcome Jehovah, 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 Yahweh steps in every time. And the outcome is always victory in the life of the individual. In Genesis 22, 13, then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there there behind him was a ram. Now, you all know the story of, of Abraham. He's got Isaac. The Lord asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. And if you read into this, If you look at it through the lens of the Holy Spirit and ask the Spirit of Revelation to come on, he'll give you the parallel of the identity that is in this request from God to Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Parallels the life of Jesus, the Father's Son and Jesus. Come on. Come on. So the description in that is Abraham is now with Isaac. He's got a bundle of wood. It's on the back of Isaac. Now, Isaac's not a little boy. He's a young man. And Isaac is, come on, Isaac is carrying the wood on his back. Is somebody getting the description here? As they go to Mount Orb, right, right, to, to, to do a sacrifice. And this is beyond Isaac's comprehension. He doesn't know what's going on. He only knows that he has to sacrifice because he asks Abraham. He says, uh, Dad, where's, where's, the, where's the ram that we're going to sacrifice? And out of Abraham's mouth, he says, God will provide. In every sacrifice or every test, God will always provide, no matter what it is. And then the word says, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And so Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son Isaac. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the Mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now, I'm just going to pull some scripture. You, you all got to do your own homework. I'm not going to do your homework for you. You go back and you study and read the scriptures, all right? Not only does the Bible describe that, Jeho- that Jehovah is our provider, Jesus is our provider, Yeshua is our provider. Come on, Yahweh is our provider, amen? Yahshua is our provider, Amen. In addition to Jesus being your deliverer, he's your provider. He's your healer. 
He's your banner. He's your shepherd. He's your peace, not partial peace. He's your total peace. Jesus is your all in all, saints. Come on. And in this sequence, what we're teaching tonight, understand God wants you to understand he is your deliverer. The deliverer has already delivered. Someone say the deliverer has already delivered. As God made provision for Abraham, not only Abraham, but his son Isaac, the action comes from the deliverer, Jehovah. Abraham was delivered from the act of killing his promised son. Sarah was free from a great loss, the loss of her firstborn son, Isaac. Watch this. And Isaac was freed, oh, so Jesus, from a premature death to fulfill the prophetic promise God intended for him. And from God's prophetic promise, from the loins of Isaac would come the descendants, somebody. That's you and I. Don't make me come out there. Come on. We are the descendants of Abraham through Isaac's loins. Come on, saints. That would come from the descendants that would receive the Abraham or the Abrahamic blessing. That would come from his lineage. That would send a deliverer, the one who would set every captive free. Isaiah 15, 4. And behold, a word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir. He's speaking to Abraham. But the one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And then the Bible says that he brought him outside, Abraham outside. He says, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you can. And if you are able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall your descendants be. What was he speaking about, beloved? That Jesus would come as one of Abraham's descendants. Representing God's government in the earth as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace, the one who would set every captive free. And it goes on in confirmation when Jesus is on the scene in in the gospel of Luke. Jesus is now before uh, the, uh, in, in the synagogues there. And he begins to prophesy. As he begins to speak the word of God, he begins to prophesy of himself. In Luke 4, 18, this is what Jesus said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he, God, has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, to preach deliverance to the captives. Somebody say captives. Captives. And recovering of sight to the blind. To sit at liberty them that are bruised. Was Jesus speaking? Jesus was speaking of humanity. Come on. The Lord had downloaded this uh, to us uh, three years ago. This concept that we have only between brothers and sisters in the faith, born again Christians. But God's word is very elaborate. It's very specific. He's not talking just about born again Christians. He's talking about humanity. The expression of Jesus' heart when, when he was on the earth, he reached out to all men and all women and all children. It must be the same way for us as we minister the word of God. He was speaking of humanity to every man, woman, and, and child born in the earth. The Bible says that before Jesus came to the earth in the form of man, during his time on the earth as the Son of God, and after he ascended up to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father of glory, he ministered to, the, to humanity, to all who needed a deliverer, to all who needed a Savior. Somebody say, the deliverer has delivered. We're going to take you into two examples here tonight. I'm going to ask you to, to, to watch this. A little bit of a demonstration. We're going to get kind of crazy in the Holy Ghost. And yeah, so that's just the way it's going to be. All right. In Daniel 1.17, it says, as for these four children. Now, uh, this is where the Babylonian uh, children were taken. Uh, uh, the Jewish ch- children were taken into captivity to Babylon. And now they're taken out of their environment, they're taken out of their culture, they're taken out of their religion, and they're put into a a place before a king. 
And it talks about Daniel and his, his uh, companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I'm going to ask you to focus on this because this is where we understand how the deliverer has already delivered. In this case, Jesus is on the scene. He's not known, the name isn't Jesus, he's known as Jehovah or Yeshua. And if Daniel 1.17, it says, as for these four children, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave them knowledge. Oh, somebody help me out. And skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. If you take a hold of this tonight and understand that the dreams, and not every dream is from the Lord, but many of the dreams that God gives you are prophetic dreams. And they're to reveal to you, to introduce to you things that are taking place in the spiritual realm. And many of those things are symbolic and they have an identity of what's taking place in the spiritual realm. And those things that are taking place in the spiritual realm will parallel the things that are taking place in the natural realm. Amen. Do you know the same purpose that God give, gave Daniel and the and the three Hebrew children, the skills and the wills, wisdom and knowledge, he's given to every born-again child of God. Every one of you have the wisdom of God. Come on, don't look at me like that. You have the knowledge of God. God has skilled you. He's given you talents, not, for just, uh, not just for uh, the, the, the things in the earth, but for a kingdom purpose. We're talking to a mighty woman of God earlier. God's given her skills and talents for kingdom purpose. Even though they were used for uh, the things of this world, now God's intervening and he's bringing uh, the reality and, the, uh, and the, yeah, the revelation of the things that he's given to her to purpose his kingdom in the earth. Come on, saints. Hallelujah. And the purpose of this learning and this, these skills and, and understanding in, in the life of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was for the events. Somebody hear me. Hear this, please. It was for the events that were going to take place in their lives, in his life, and in the three Hebrew children during their time of captivity. We're ready to jump on this. Somebody say the deliverer has delivered. In Daniel chapter 3, to the events, the account in, in, in this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three scores cubic and breadth thereof, six cubits, and set up in the, in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. I'm not going to go through all the whole portion of Scripture. And so what we know the Scripture tells us that as uh, Nebuchadnezzar creates this image, this God that would look like him, he was requiring that all that were in that region, in that, the vicinity there, when they would hear the sounds of instruments, there would be a su su significant sound of instruments at a specific time. And the Bible says that they were all to bow before this image. But in the midst of this, let me get this real quick here. But in the midst of this, it talks about the, the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rules of the provinces were there together into the dedication of that image. So was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And now the time comes, or it was brought to the king's attention that the Jewish uh, children were not bowing. They weren't going to bow. And we all know the story there that Nebuchadnezzar becomes furious because they wouldn't, um, the, the Hebrew children wouldn't bow to this image. And in verse 12 it says, And there were certain Jews whom had set over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon, that was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O oh God, have not regarded thee, and have not, and served not your God, or worshiped the gold image which you have set up. And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar was in a rage. Come on. He was furious. He says, really? Well, I'll show them. Go heat up the furnace that's out there and heat it up seven times hotter than normal. I want you to watch this and, and understand that because many times we have this idea as we read these 
uh, these sequences and stories in the Bible that they were for their time, but it has a significant parallel in our lives now in the natural realm and in the spiritual realm. And the Bible talks about how these things come forth and things uh, that come forth in our, our, our lives, the situations, maybe a trial or tribulations. But I'm telling you here today, we've got an image for you. Some of you may, may have, have already been through a fiery furnace or there's a, an attempt of the enemy to take you into a furnace of fire. But tonight we've got a good word. We've got a sure word of prophecy. You see, in all this preparation uh, in the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the knowledge and the skills were given them. It was a learning procedure so that when we, they would step into the event, they would see the deliverer deliver them. Come on. Now, if you read, this, if you read the scriptures, there was just so much in the story, and I'm not going to take time to read it. Again, read your Bibles. So now, the, now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are before King Nebuchadnezzar, and he puts a question to you, how come you're not going to bow before me? And these three young men were so full of the Word of God. They knew the Scriptures. They had an intimacy. They had a relationship with this one, Jehovah. Amen? And in the spite of it, and even the, even the concept, knowing that they were going to be put in the furnace, this is what they say. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king after he said you're not going to bow they said we're not going to do it oh nebuchadnezzar now watch how they respond to him they honor him as king they honor him his position his rule and authority and yet they knew the one in whom they needed to honor was greater than the king the earthly king and so they respond to him and they say oh nebuchadnezzar we are not careful to answer thee in this manner if it be so, oh, somebody, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, we're good. We're good. But let it be known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve your God nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his vintage or his, his countenance was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now remember, he put them over that region to rule and reign. Therefore he spoke and commanded they should be, that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind, please, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so what are they bound up? The Bible says that they're bound up in their garments. They're bound up in what represented their, their religion. They were, bound, they were tied up the clothing that they wore. Come on, somebody. All bound up in that. And, and brother, I'm going to need you to help me out here. Tonight, you get to be Jesus. Come on over here. I'm going to have you stand here for just a minute. You'll, you'll know what I'm doing here. So here, here they are now. The Bible says that they're bound up in their clothes, and they can't move. So much so that they're, they're bound so tight that they have to be thrown into the furnace. And it says that they were thrown down, bound in their clothing. Their clothing represented everything that they were. Amen. I'm telling you tonight, saints, you are wrapped in garments. You are wrapped in spiritual garments that God has put on unto you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So watch this. So now they're bound up and they're thrown into the furnace. So you won't be able to get this on, the, on, the, on life. They're thrown in the furnace and they're bound. They're bound. Bound. And the fire's furnace is raging in heat and heat. And the Bible says... That as they're bound, they're laid down. Just I'm gonna have you use me just a minute. That they're bound, they're laid down there, and they can't move. And all of a sudden, the the king says, "Have we not cast three men into this furnace? Are they not thrown down, laid down like this? They're bound and they can't move. But yet, come over here, brother. Come over here, Jesus. Come over here. Pick me up. Come on, gonna pick me up." But do we not see 
three men standing in the midst of the fire. So no matter what the situation is, no matter how, how deep or how, how high the flame is, is burning, when you're in that fiery furnace, Jesus is not going to leave you laying there. He's going to lift you up. Come on, he's going to pick you up. You may be bound. Thank you, brother. You may be bound. You may be bound in, the, in, 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 that, in, in those uh, garments like that, but Jesus will lift you up. And the Bible says that at that point, the Nebuchadnezzar says, I see four men. We put three men in, but I see one like the Son of Man in the midst of that fire. And then the Bible says that the king came over to the entrance. Watch this. She came into the entrance where Shadrach, Meshach, and again Abednego was put in. And now he stands at the entrance. And I'm telling you, saints, Brother Michael got this today. No matter what entrance to a fiery furnace that the enemy will put you in, God will make that entrance an exit. He makes it an exit to get you out of that furnace in Jesus' mighty name. And so the Bible says that that Nebuchadnezzar says, come forth. And as they came out, come on, somebody. As they came out, the Bible says that their garments were not singed. They were not burned. Not one hair on their head. I don't have to worry about that. But not one head on their hair was singed. And I'm telling you, when you encounter a fiery furnace, and when you come out of that furnace, you're going to come out looking better. As your garments are going to be looking better. Your countenance are going to be looking better. Your attitude is going to be better. Your health is going to be better. Whatever the aspect of whatever, when God takes you out, when he takes you out from that entrance and makes that entrance an exit, you're going to come out better than when you went in in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, somebody. Feeling better, sounding better. Your spiritual garments are going to be cleaner. They're going to be brighter, more radiant before they were, uh, before they were when you were thrown in. Somebody say the deliverer has delivered. The deliverer, the deliverer has delivered. Come on. Jesus. There's some of you who've been in a furnace. You've, you've encountered that, that fire. You've encountered the, the fire, the, the intensity of that fire by the enemy. Hallelujah. And God's telling me to tell you, whatever you went through as he brought you out of that furnace in the past, if and when the enemy would try to put you in another furnace, he's going to deliver you out of that furnace again in Jesus' mighty name. Now, we're not going to a naked. Listen to what God is saying because we're stepping into the year of 2022 where the dynamics of the Holy Spirit are going to be so influential in our lives that no matter what furnace is heated, no matter how the furnace is prepared, no matter how hot it gets, you may be bound up in, in the situation and you're not able to move. But in the midst of that, God will take you out. He'll pull you out. And you're going to come out greater than when you went in. In Jesus' mighty name. Come here. Come here. When the Lord was putting this message together, he put your face in front of my face. Go ahead. Put your hands up, sweet. And not to go into all the details, but this word is so relative to you. Because there were many furnaces that the enemy threw you into. And in the midst of that, there was that, that place you weren't able to move. You weren't able to transition. You felt the intensity of the heat. And yet in the midst of that, Maraka Gasaraka, God was your deliverer. The deliverer had delivered. Shiko Fede Sirike. And because you went through what you went through, you came out stronger. You, you came out greater. You came out looking better. Your garments are even greater than when they were when you went in. And the Lord's saying, the time for you of any more fiery furnaces have come to an end. I've tested the faith that I have put in you. And you stood to believe me for what I said I would do. 
even in the prophetic releases of my words, says God, when it seemed that the enemy was rushing in from the right and rushing in from the from the left, and you had nowhere to turn to, but you turned to me, the author and the finisher of your faith. And you withstood the moment. You withstood, you withstood the heat of that furnace, says the Lord. And in the most appropriate time, did I not lift you up in the midst of that? Even as you were bound to that, did I not lift you up, says God? Knowing that this day, I've called you forth out of that furnace. And my, my testing on you, has brought you to a place to where I've proven you and you have proven yourself not before man but before me, says God. Therefore, I shut the doors to any other furnace that the enemy would try to put you in, says God, that you would walk in the freedom and the liberty of my love caressed by the kiss of my lips upon thy cheek, says the spirit of living God. You are mine, chosen by me for this end time movement for my spirit. Let thy, whoo, let thy life be a witness to those in whom you know, says the spirit of the living God. The Father bless this one. Sakaria flakos. Sirikin. And it falls into the declaration of God's word in, in revelations that you have overcome by the what? The word of your testimony and by the blood of the lamb. To know the deliverer has delivered in Jesus' mighty name. Karabosataria. Somebody give God praise in this house tonight. There's many other things and in, in many other examples in the Bible. And we're going to talk about one more here tonight. You're all familiar with this. This portion or this scene, this account that has taken place in 1 Samuel 17. It has to do with David as a shepherd boy and then this one known as Goliath. All right. The name Goliath means to... It means to uncover something, to reveal or to expose. It also means the name of, of Goliath means to, um, to banish, uh, to evict, and to uproot, and to cause a separation. And in 1 Samuel 17, 7, in 17, 17, the Bible talks about Jesse's three sons and Eli, uh, Eli uh, being the eldest. And in verse 17, it says this. And then I, there's so much in the scripture, I, I try to put into a Reader's Digest version here. So do your homework, saints. In 1 Samuel 17, 17, then Jesus, Jesse said to David, his son. Now listen, in this, this portion, to grasp and understand that when God speaks to us, we need to respond to what he's asking us to do. And although it may seem impractical, it may not make any sense. In the, end, in the end, your outcome will be greater than when you went in. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. Come on. Listen to the voice of God. And so here's Jesse um, speaking to David. Now, David is the third youngest of his three brothers. Eab is the oldest. And this is Jesse's instructions to David. And we have to understand that when when these men and women of God were told to do something or to give an instruction or command, it wasn't coming from them. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit to do these things that the fulfillment of God's plan in the scenario, in the situation, would come to pass. In everything in our lives, God has a plan, purpose with a design and an objectivity that his prophetic word spoken into our lives, whether it be a written word, come on, a written word or a rhema word will come to pass in our lives. And in this particular situation, the spirit of God is now upon Jesse. Jesse's instructing his, his son, David. Listen to what he says. David, take for your brothers an ephod of this roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread, and run quickly to camp to the camp of your brothers. I'm going to stop here for just a minute. And if you read the scriptures, you understand. Here now we've got the Philistine army on one mountain. We've got Israel's army on 
this other mountain, and there's a valley in between. Now, they've been out there for 40 days. They're running out of provisions. And so Jesse instructs David to take the, the provisions to his son. It says, also take these 10 cuts of cheese to the commander of the unit. See how your brothers are doing and bring back news of them. Now they were with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Eli fighting with the Philistines. Now Eli, his oldest brother, heard what he said to these men. So now David is on the scene. He comes. He leaves his flock. He didn't leave his flock unattended. They put someone over to watch his flock. So he's responsible for what God had given him. And now David's on the scene and he begins to question what's going on. See, the battle hasn't taken place yet, but now, now God takes David to the forefront of the battle. God never intended David to step into the battle of the armies. His fight was going to be between this Goliath, this giant, as God was instructing him to do. Now, consider David. He, he's a shepherd boy. Come on, shepherd boy. Come on. Knows the word of God, confident, knowing that no matter what God asks him to do, God's going to, God is back. And God's going to move with David. Amen? Amen? Why? And so here's his older brother. And, and saints, uh, we, I say this, with, say this with all generosity because I know every one of, the, of us have gone into this. We have experiences from our siblings, from even our biological parents and, and our cousins. Amen? So, David's on the scene, he begins a question, and his older brother says to him, why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness, trying to put blame on David? He says, I know your presumption, your overconfidence. Somebody say overconfidence. And the evil in your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. And David's response to him, what have I done now? What is not just the harmless question that I have asked you? Why are you, why are you saying this to me? And then, I love this part. This just hit me upside the face. Then uh, his, to his older brother, I'm not saying this, do this to your sibling. I'm just saying this is what took place. Then David turned away from Elab and to someone else and asked the same question. David was seeking an answer. And the people gave him the same answer as the first time. Saying so sometimes a harmless question that comes to us from those who are close to us will provoke an argument about the word of God or the things that are in the kingdom of God. Oftentimes it will provoke a question to, to stir up confusion and be used to try to prevent you from doing what God is asking you to do. And you know what I'm talking about here. God calls us and asks us to do so many things that even uh, those uh, who are closest to us, they may not even know the, know the Lord himself, but even friends and flames, they just don't understand why are you doing this? And we say, well, God told us to do this, and, 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 and they turn. They'll come with, a, with a, a, a word of accusation or something to try to prevent you from doing what God is asking you to do. But at that moment, we got to rise up into the occasion and put aside. The Bible says he makes our faces a flint. Come on, gives us a spine of steel that as he inspires us to move forward and do something, we simply got to do it. We cannot be concerned what man is saying. We cannot be concerned about the opinions of man. We cannot be concerned about other doctrines that come in to try to stop us from doing what God is asking us to do. And tonight, you're going to leave here under a fresh anointing. A clarity is going to come to your ears. You're going to begin hearing God like you've never heard him before. And when you hear him, you're going to respond to what he's asking you to do. In spite of the soothsayers or anyone else that's trying to come against you. D Jesus was confronted by that to one whom he loved so, so greatly, Peter. Huh? Anyway. Stay on track, Michael. Hallelujah. And so even in this harmless question, you know, when I was reading this, it, it says that David turned away from e e Elab. Elab, hear this, saints. When God speaks to you, 
He speaks to you, but he may not be speaking to another person. He's speaking directly to you. And the Bible says that David turned away from Elab. Elab didn't hear the instructions given to David from their father, Jesse. And so what happens, contention rises up. And you hear the anger and the jealousy that is in Elab against his younger brother. Contention, jealousy, or bitterness towards David because of his success in killing a lion and bear with his own hands. If Elab would have taken control of his tongue and kept silent, ouch, the Lord would have spoken to him about his plan to use David to operate with the supernatural power of God again to kill this Goliath who was a giant in the eyes of men threatening the armies of Israel. Now through the lens of the Holy Spirit, oh, somebody help me out. Now through the lens of the Holy Spirit, David saw the illusion of the statue, statue of Goliath, and it was not a threat to him. Somebody say, the deliverer delivers. Excuse me, the deliverer delivers. Hallelujah. See, saints, there's, there's a place of vulnerability. And vulnerability means it's the quality of, or a state of being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. Goliath's spot of vulnerability was in the area of his forehead that was not covered. This was his vulnerable spot, and Jehovah knew of it. And I'm telling you, it's, I'm telling you to prophesy to you today. God knows the vulnerability to every spirit that tries to come against you. He knows where to go after it to bring it down. And he, he's given you his word to implement that word to come against those, those Goliaths in your lives. In the case of every unclean spirit, it's, a, it's the name. I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. So in this vulnerability of, of where uh, God used David to come against or to target Goliath. Amen. There was a place that, that God knew about that would bring down the giant. And I'm telling you here that by the Spirit of God that in the case of every unclean spirit, it is the same. It is, excuse me, it is the name that is above every name. Jesus Christ, the Son of living God. That is the vulnerability into the life of every unclean spirit. Come on. And so David, he begins to release a prophetic declaration. The opportunity came, and David begins to prophesy. Oh, prophesy to the giant in the name of Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. The prophecy was heard by the armies of both Israel and the Philistine. So was the prophetic word heard to every spiritual ear in heaven and in the earth and under the earth. And the Bible says, I, I just I got a vision of this today, that as David began prophesying, <laughs> woo, the angelic hosts in heaven were listening. They were tuning in. And they were watching with excitement and anticipation. And as they heard the prophetic release from the young shepherd boy, they were in excitement. Hey, this is going to go down the way God says it's going to go down. Not the way the Philistines think it's going to go down. And not the way that my armies of Israel think it's going to go down. This is going to go down. This is the angelic host converse, conversing. It's kind of Michael's, Brother Michael's story. But they're conversing, <laughs> saying, this is how it's going to go down. And with the, the, uh, what I got to, the, the demonic spirits, they were listening. As the angelic hosts were listening, the demonic spirits were listening and watching and trembling as they heard the young shepherd boy prophesying, knowing that this prophetic, prophetic gift has power and ability to destroy kings and to destroy their kingdoms. Amen? To the screen, please. Join us, saints. 1 Samuel 17, 41, and I'm going to read. 
Because we're going to give you something here tonight to where you're going to go out. And you're going to be able to target. You're going to find the vulnerable, vulnerable spots of the enemy. Those spirits of oppression and depression. Those spirits of suicide. The spirits of financial lack. The spirit of, of health. Come on. And he, we're going to walk out of here. And you're going to be able to target, find that vulnerable spot. And when you release the word of God, that prophetic word, they're going to come down. That's right. Come on. Yeah. They're going to come down. 1 Samuel 17, 41. The Philistines came and approached, there we go, approached David. Yeah, I'm getting excited. With his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistines looked around and saw David, he, de he derided or ridiculed and disparaged or belittled him because he was just a young man with a ruddy complexion and a, a handsome appearance. And the Philistines said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with a shepherd's staff? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Now listen to what the Bible says. The Philistine is now trying to curse David, uh, yeah, David by their gods, the gods that don't exist. Is somebody hear me? The gods that don't exist trying to put a curse on David. And watch how God intervenes. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, come to me. Let's stay in the, in the, in the understand this parallel. Does it have, anyway, all right. Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come. I'll interpret that for you. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabbath, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have taunted. And this was David's prophetic release. And I pray you get this deep in your spirit. So when the Goliaths try to come and stand in front of you, you'll stand with the proclamation. You'll stand with the declaration. You'll stand and you'll speak the prophetic release of God's word against that Goliath. And that Goliath will come down. It's a guarantee. Amen. This, do, this day the Lord will hand you over to me, Goliath. And I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the corpse of the enemy of Philistine this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth. And so that all earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that this entire assembly, come on, Maraka, the armies of Israel, the armies of the Philistine, and the armies of the demonic hosts. Come on. Come on. Get this. Hallelujah. And I will give the corpse of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky of the air and the earth, wild beasts of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and this entire assembly in the earth realms and in the heavenlies. In the heavenly realms. May know that the Lord does not save with the sword or with the spear. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will hand you over to us. Saints, this, this engaging of spiritual warfare. God never intended David to go into the battle in the armies that were opposing each other. All God did was ask David to stand at the forefront. Come on. At the forefront of where this battle was going to begin. And then the Bible says, and when the Philistines rose and came forward to meet David, when the giant Goliath rose, David ran, come see, David ran quickly toward the battle line. He didn't step into the battle. He came to the battle line to meet the Philistines. And David put his hand into his bag and he took out a smooth stone. We're going to give you something here tonight. And slung it and it struck the Philistine on his forehead. David, let me, when David released that stone, 
there was an anointing on that stone that it would thrust itself through the air and find that vulnerable spot on the head of Goliath. Now understand that, that the, the I, I looked this up, that the helmet that he wore, it protected his, his head and the side of his face, the sides of his face, but the entire face and the forehead was completely open. God found a spot. I said, God knew of a spot. And when that stone went, it was anointed, directed by Holy Ghost, and it found that vulnerable spot. And when that, that flat stone hit the forehead of Goliath, it took him out. He didn't even have time to tap out. God just took him out in Jesus' mighty name. Come on. But the Bible says, and David ran in the opportunity. He ran after that, the opportunity to bring down that Goliath in his, that was put before him. I want to talk to you. The, it says that the stone penetrated his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Come on, saints. Five stones. It's a whole teaching in itself, many uh, explanations. The number five is spiritual application, a fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, preacher, teacher, a variety of other uh, explanations of what a number five means. And yet the Bible says that they were smooth stones. They weren't a rock. They were flat stones. Now, here is where God, who's created all things that exist, he now puts into effect the laws of physics, the laws to which he created. Amen? And why did God, why did David seek out five flat stones? David had knowledge. He had understanding to the laws of physics. So he picks up five stones. Get this, saints. A smooth stone, and what it explains, a smooth stone will offer less resistance in the air, in flight, that would travel with greater speed and accuracy. Come on. God gave David understanding and knowledge. Don't go pick up a rock. Pick up five stones because I have a plan. I'm going to apply the laws of physics. I'm going to put in your hand a weapon that is going to bring down that Goliath. And as you initiate what I'm asking you, you're going to see victory over your life in Jesus' mighty name. So you read the story, and in conclusion, it says, So David trumpeted over the Philistines with a sling and a stone, and he struck down the Philistine, and he killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. So he ran and stood over the Philistine, grasped the sword, and drew it out of his head, <coughs> out of his sleeve, and killed him, and he cut off his head with it. The application here tonight says, is to understand that when we battle in these things, God doesn't ask us to step into the battle. All he asks us to do is to come to the forefront of the battle and then to use, initiate the weapons that he has given us. And it may not be a, 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 a physical stone in your hand, but he's given you a spiritual stone. He's given you weapons to fight against the wars uh, uh, and the accounts of the enemy that he's trying to come against us. When those, when those Goliaths in our lives come forward. You've got to confront them. You can't sit back. Israel sat on one side of the mountain and Philistines sat on the other side of the mountain waiting for God to do something. So I'm not going to do nothing. This is your battle. And yet David knew that there had to be an attempt to bring down this Goliath because as long as that Goliath remained there and none, none of uh, the people in, in the army of Israel were going to confront him, they were afraid because they saw him as they saw him. But David had insight to see the statue of that Goliath. And I'm telling you tonight, in the name of Jesus, God's going to open up your spiritual ears. So when you're confronted with a spiritual giant, you're going to see him or see it in the manner that it is. Not based on the illusion by which you see in the, in the, with a natural eye, but with the lens of the Holy Spirit, you're going to see what's before you. And with such confidence, when that spirit is exposed and the dimension of that spirit is exposed, God's going to cause you to run like David to confront that giant and bring him down in Jesus' mighty name. We're entering into this year 2022 with an expectation, and we're not speaking on negative things. This is the reality. This is what's taking place in the lives of every child of God. So that when the Goliaths come or when a, a situation comes to where the enemy is trying to put you into a fire first, furnace, you're going to come out of that furnace better than when the way you went in. 
and the ability to when that Goliath comes and stands before you. God's going to give you the ability, the tenacity, the courage, the strength uh, to, to go after them, not in fear of the giant, but in the fear of God. Jesus. Jesus. Shika Suryabaki. Serapokosa. I've got to stop. There's so much more here. I've got to stop. I, I, I'm, I'm recognizing, I'm acknowledging the anointing of God in this house. And when the battles come, when you're standing to a place where you begin to recognize there's something going on in your life, you're sensing it in the spiritual realm. Don't wait for it to manifest in the natural. Come on, somebody. Get alone with God. Get alone with Jesus. Be the recipient like David. He was ready. He knew the word of God. God gave him the skills and the talents to understand what he was about to, uh, to encounter. Uh, God gave uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the understanding of knowing that as they were being prepared to go into this furnace, God would deliver him. The deliverer has delivered, saints. And I'm telling you today, in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's more in this, in this, this uh, explanation, but I'm not going to read it all. The day you became born again, my God, I feel the anointing. The day, the day you became born again, spirit-filled, when you submitted your life unto God, he became your deliverer at that moment. Not for just some things, but everything that the enemy would try to intend. He delivered you from your past. Can I get a witness? I said he delivered you from your past to bring you into your present so you can exercise and execute his will in the future. The deliverer has already delivered. Sheka protobos, soko siket, sere preki, brako sarako. And so when you're here, saints, when you're here, Maraka, in this place, knowing that the deliverer has delivered you, don't look back to the things that are behind you. Look to the present, to the things that are before you, and get ready to the things that see the things that are ahead of you in Jesus' mighty name. Because in the midst, every time a situation comes up and you acknowledge God as your deliverer, the one who has already delivered you, you can walk in the freedom, you can walk in the liberty, you can walk in the confidence that God has already did what he said he would do for you.